Hello, welcome to today's screencast. The focus is going to be on memory models within the skill acquisition part of the specification. Um, so, uh, quick pointer, um, we're basically looking at memory um, as a vital part of sport. Um, so we're looking at the processes by which we can store information to memorize it. Secondly, how we can use the information we memorize to actually perform skills. Now, we have to look at two models. Today's focus is going to be on something called the Atkinson and Schifrin's multi-store model of memory. Okay, so with regard to this, it's quite important you get and understand it is that, you know, within this model, you have to be able to use the following assessment objectives. You've got to be able to describe each part of a model, which I'll show you in a second. You've got to be able to apply it to a sporting example and you've got to be able to evaluate it. Okay, so that's a really important just to make sure that by the end of the lesson, you will be expected to do that. So let's have a look then. Back to the Schiffman's multi-store model. So if I say to you now, I should have a look at it there. That that's it. And uh, let me just take you up to here. What is the focus of this model? Well, firstly, it, it's a model that kind of depicts or, or kind of explains how we store information or skills in our long-term memory. So we have a look at three parts. It's the multi-store memory model. So you've got um, three different stores of memory here. Okay, and we're going to have a look how when we try and learn something the processes or the kind of stages behind how we put that information into our long-term memory. That's the first thing. Second thing we're going to have a look at is the process of describing how this model allows us to use the information or motor programs, as we'll call it later in the screencast, stored in our long-term memories, how we retrieve that to be able to actually perform a skill. So, for example, when you're catching a ball in whatever sport it is, whether that's basketball, cricket, rugby, rounders, netball, whenever those, when you do that catch, we're going to have a look at how this model, in kind of almost like a, I suppose, a split second, allows us to go from seeing something to chunking and comparing it and then retrieving it back to be able to perform it. And, you know, that you just take it for granted but you're using your memory every time you perform a sports skill in your sport so let's have a look then the process multi of the memory i suggest you get your kind of uh, key points down you might just go back to here now if you want to make sure you've got this down as your kind of uh, start point to make notes from Okay, so a lot them. So first up, multi store model memory. Let's just quickly go through the key parts there. These are your three stages. You've got the sensory memory, short term memory, long term memory. When information comes into us, okay, we basically pass it through this process. The first thing that kind of receives information when we are kind of trying to perform something, when we're trying we hear something for the first time, it has to go through our sensory memory, then it passes through via a process here into our short term memory when it gets into there. If we can kind of rehearse it, it will then go into our long-term memory. So let's have a look at this in action then. Let's use the example. I said earlier we use catching, so we'll stick with that example. So catching a ball in cricket rounders, uh, whichever sport you want to use, rugby, basketball. So let's have a look there. When we are trying to describe the characteristics of each stage of the sensor, uh, the multi-store model of memory, it's really important we use these, these key triggers. So we need to have an understanding of the following. Firstly, the first characteristic is going to be how much information can be stored in each part of the memory. The second characteristic is looking at how long we can store that information now once we've done that and we've got across each part we'll have a look at how you can apply it to a sporting example specifically so for now we're looking at the concept of storing information when you see it for the first time so sensory memory there if you consider this this part of the memory is absolutely vital. This is the, the kind of part of the memory that receives all of the different senses. So if you're talking about, ca example, catching a cricket ball, uh, if you're thinking here, the senses, you, you might hear a ball coming towards you. You might see a ball coming towards you. And then you've also got in that kind of situation, you could maybe, if you're standing in a field playing cricket, you've got lots of different things that you could be looking at. People walking around, trees, whatever else, uh, opposition players. And what the sensory memory does, it basically stores unlimited information so basically it's all that information kind of whether it be the sounds the sight um, the smell of the ball for example the leather ball in cricket whether it's the kind of crowd that you can store unlimited information but the kind of flip side to that is that the information can only be stored for one second now, this is really interesting because you can only sort of one second and, and that reason being is once it comes in we have to then pick out the most important piece of information um, that has come through so for example if we're looking about catching a cricket ball we've got all of this kind of meaningless information and we use a process called selective attention selective attention basically allows us to kind of uh, filter in 
the relevant piece of information, so the short-term memory, and filter out the irrelevant information. So I'm sure you can see this now for catching a ball. The important information, selective attention, allows us to filter in the ball and filter out the crowd okay uh, the opposition uh, it might be our teammates or whatever else in the environment it allows us to filter that out so once then we have got that information through we then take it through so we've got our one piece of information we've got the ball coming at us so now what we have to do is take it through we push it into the short-term memory so we've gone from having uh, an unlimited uh, information store to suddenly going into our new short-term memory. Now, the short-term memory is the working part of the memory, and this basically focuses saying that how much information could we store using this trigger here? It can store five to nine pieces of information. Okay, that is the kind of uh, the limit of it. People, would, you, you could, you're allowed to put seven in there. I think in in psychology as an A level, they put seven plus or minus two. Okay, so it could be anywhere between five and nine pieces of information. Okay, so that five to nine pieces of information go in there and then if I said to you from that point how long can you store that information in the short-term memory we well, could store it in there for 30 seconds now within that 30 second period if we want to store it and take it into the long-term memory okay what we have to do is we have to use the process of rehearsal so we have to go over it in our head we have to repeat it maybe physically at that point allows us to take the information into our long-term memory now the long-term memory has a limited, it, you can uh, kind of learn uh, a limited information, okay? So it can store unlimited information in that long-term memory and you know it, we'll look at it a little bit later but that information is stored and you'll remember this from kind of different types of practice that we've done earlier in the year it's stored as motor programs the motor programs are those movement plans that are stored in a long-term memory that we can retrieve when we need them uh, in sporting actions or for example in your exams when you're uh, you've got loads of information in your exam if it's in your long-term memory you can retrieve it uh, and send it to where we need to go so on top of that you can now uh, store, how long can you store it for? Well, you can store this information permanently in the long-term memory, as long as you practice um, the, the stuff that you've put in there. Okay, so you have to keep practicing that. So if I put that in there, that is the process of storing. So if we go on from there, you get loads of information come in. Okay, for one second, sensory memory. Then we have the process of selective attention to filter in the relevant information, for example, the ball, filter out the irrelevant information, for example, the crowd when trying to catch. This sends in to our short-term memory, which gives us five to nine pieces of information for 30 seconds. And then the information that we get chance to rehearse, to go over in our head, to repeat verbally, can go into our long-term memory, which can hold a limited piece of information and it can last permanently. Okay, so the information can be stored there permanently. And if you want to make a note maybe here, as motor programs. So that is the process of storing information. You will have been through that process, I'm sure, yourselves uh, with information. You go through it every day, every lesson of your kind of academic life. But we also go through it in sport when we're learning new skills. So let's have a look at how this applies then to uh, kind of uh, uh, the actual sports skill. How do we describe then how this memory model allows us to actually produce sports skills? Well, let's have a look. So the first thing that we have to now, these are the characteristics of each stage of the multi-store model of memory or each store within the memory model. So now what we have to do is describe how they would help us perform a sport, an example. So let's have a look, catching a ball. So if we look at catching a ball, let's describe it and link it to that example. First one, this part of the memory, the sensory memory, allows us to detect the stimulus. Okay, so it detects the stimulus. For example, in this case, we detect the height and speed of the ball coming at us, okay? And that applies it to an example. So you're thinking now, ball's coming at you, this is what your sensory memory allows you to do, okay? Now, at that point, obviously, it allows us to filter in the ball, uh, the height and speed of the ball, and it allows us to filter out any irrelevant information, such as the crowd. On top of that, we're looking at the next section, what happens in the short-term memory? Well, it's really important now, because we've only got five to nine pieces of information, okay allowed in our short-term memory or that we can store in our, our short-term memory we have to use this kind of this kind of concept or the skill of chunking so for example you consider now with regard to a phone number if you're trying to remember a phone number out of context you would maybe you wouldn't remember uh, all nine or ten numbers separately you would remember them and group them together so what you would do with regard to sporting situations the short-term memory is responsible for interpreting the information judging it for example this stuff here and also 
it allows us to chunk the information or group it together and compare to the long-term memory. Okay, that is what its job is. So when we have that ball come through, we detected the height and speed of the ball. Our short-term memory allows us to, to interpret it. It also allows us to chunk it. So rather than remembering the height, speed, velocity, trajectory of the ball as separate information, we will group that together as one piece of information, e.g. the ball flight. Okay, that then works in the following way. When we get that information in, we compare it to our long-term memory. So with regard to the ball, I'll put it onto here, the chunk in the height and speed of the ball, okay? And then you compare the ball flight to those stored in our long-term memory. So the motor programs of a ball flight in that long-term memory. Now, once we get onto here, to our long-term memory, quickly, you can imagine this happening. The ball's coming out. You've chunked the height and speed of the ball into one group, one piece of information, and then we've compared it very quickly with our long-term memory. What's the role of the long-term memory then? Well, firstly, of course, it is for, its key role is it stores motor programs, firstly. So that's your first point. Then it recognizes and retrieves these motor programs to our short-term memory. So what does that mean in relation to our catch? It means that the catch technique is stored okay, in our, in our long-term memory and it is then retrieved to our short-term memory. Now the short-term memory, okay, as you can see on today, it's retrieved to our short-term memory which allows us to catch the ball. Okay, so the final part is that our short-term memory is the workspace, it's the working part of it, it is responsible for us actually catching the ball. Okay, so they are the key pieces of information uh, with regard to the multi-store model of memory. You have to have an understanding of both the characteristics and then the describing how they apply to the performance of a sports skill. So these bits here, characteristics going across and here, and here and these bits across here are the process of storage. How do we store that information? How long can we store it? How do we get it from seeing it, hearing it, to actually being able to remember it? Then we have to think about ourselves. We are sports students. You are A-level PE students. Therefore, we've got to be able to apply it to the process of games. When we, something happens in a game or your activity, how do we use our memory to be able to retrieve it and perform it? So make sure you get yourself uh, set up for that. Uh, we'll be lots and lots of activities to embed this in the lesson. And we will also be looking at how you evaluate uh, the multi-store model of memory. Okay. Thanks very much. In fact, what I might do for those people who want just a quick checker, I'll go back onto here. Why don't you have a go at this point and see if you could uh, fill that out uh, from memory. That might be a task to do when you're ready. Okay, thanks very much.